Hello, precious mamas and mamas to be. Welcome to my mind opening interview series with important authorities in the birth world. This is your host, Ilka B, with the Liberated Birth Movement, broadcasting from around the world. In this interview series, we're going to once again uncover myths, ask interesting questions, and get out of the box answers. Welcome, welcome, precious mamas, to another interview of the Liberated birth movement and today I have on Betsy Schwartz and Betsy and I know each other for a few years now she is a very passionate birth advocate she's an ad, uh, educator she's a birth doula postpartum doula doula drainer she has lots and lots of experience all throughout the prenatal and and postnatal experience and I'm really excited to have her on today hi Betsy Hi, Yoke. Okay. I love hanging out with you. This is great. <laughs> so tell me real quick, you are traveling around and you say you're somewhere in New Hampshire right now or something? Yes. So this month I've been traveling. I taught the Forgotten Fourth Trimester class in Brooklyn Ooh. and I had a game day with my game there and did some visiting and fun stuff. Now we moved on to Mass, New Hampshire area, more for visiting and fun and Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I totally forgot that. So Betsy also created an amazing game called Down the Canal. Is that right? And it's Down the Canal. mamas and couples to, um, you know, go through and figure out like with the current knowledge of what they have, what they know right now, how would their birth experience end up um, becoming or what it, what it would be like. And it's an educational game and it's also like a lot of doulas use it, right? Yes, yes. Um, it's, so it's on Amazon and it's in an educational catalog and I want everybody to play it <laughs> who's ever old enough to, to read the questions because as you know, we want people to want to know more about birth and that's what I'm about. Totally. And um, yeah, we're going to get to that later on where we can start actually educating women way before they actually get pregnant. But let me ask you, like, give me a little bit about your background. I know, as I said, you are in the birth world for 30 years or something. So Almost. you're like total an expert and you like, what is your passion and how did you, how did you become a birth educator? So, of course, it started with my first birth, like many of us, right? We give birth the first time, um, however we do that. So my first was a hospital birth, but I didn't have the support of, of a partner at the time. I had been left, and my mother and a friend supported me through my labor, through my birth, and afterwards, I had a lot of support. So I felt the love and support, mm. even though I had a lot going on up here that probably inhibited me knowing what I know now right. uh, a lot was going on but I learned that that support was key it was huge and I didn't know what a doula was mm. but of course my friend and mom acted as my birth doula and postpartum doula and then I found out what that was a couple years later there was an, a little ad in a local Boston paper help new mothers after birth with breastfeeding and I said Wow, I can get paid to mother another mother. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, was, we should, um, maybe we should stop here real quick and, and just uh, real quick um, explain what is a doula. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the women that see this uh, interview, they know already what a doula is, but um, maybe you can explain we both are birth doulas, postpartum doulas. So what is a doula for you in your eyes and what does she do for women? It is really about mothering the mother. So I'm there, just say that you're my client. I'm calling yeah. you my client. My Ilka, how are you today? What's going on? How are you feeling? How can I support you? Mm -hmm. Really, I I'm there for you and the family, right? Mm -hmm. Depends if it's, you know, for the birth or after. But it's all about what can I do? How can I serve? And how can I guide you and be that calming energy? Mm, mm, I like non-medical support too by the way not not any medical no diagnosis simply emotional support mm. physical practice I say simply yes. <laughs> I, I think I that is like something that we sometimes totally forget in in the whole birthing process that 
the emotional support that women need throughout this is not just simply, right? It's like that is what women need the most and what they get the less or the least, right? And, um, and we, f we often focus so much on that physical event or if you're, you know, in the medical system and you give birth with, you know, a medical provider in the hospital and we're focusing so much on that medical event of birth and we forget about all the emotions that are involved. So, yeah, doulas do a great job and um, in, in holding space for mamas, right? So, yeah, yes. awesome. Okay, tell yeah. me more. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's fine. No, but holding space, you know, a lot of times that comes up and like, what does that mean? What does right. that look like? Well, I have to say that when I gave birth and when I was raising my kids, I did not have the practice of Reiki. Reiki is universal life force energy, and it, it helps move the energy through the body that's whatever, wherever it's stuck. Mm -hmm. And what an amazing, amazing practice to use for the whole process. You know, because of um, that energy giving the body what it needs to, whether it to be to heal or, or to, to move or whatever it is. But the point is, it's all about energy. So what is holding space? It's being, it's being, right? You know, uh, Deb Pascali Benar, our friend and colleague, who talks about be, uh, not, instead of doula, be la. Be la. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the like doula that. is doing, right? Totally. Something like that. But really, it's about being. So how am I being? How am I holding that space, what energy am I bringing with my beingness to that room, to that environment? And it really is about keeping the calm and reminding whoever is before us, you know, to stay present and whether it's at the birth or even if it's afterwards and things are chaotic and the baby and crying and learning and it's just so much, right? You totally. know, for a new mom especially. Yes. Yeah, I was just talking with Jane Austen. She's a prenatal yoga teacher. And she was also saying like all the tools in yoga, they are, you know, not just there for, for um, pregnancy and birth, but also for that entire path into motherhood and for the rest of your life, actually. And I think that's um, what Reiki does as well, right? It's just it gives you tools to be more present and to stay more in balance and to not freak out when like things go crazy around you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's so, right. so you, you, you've experienced your first birth, you said you really liked the support you got and you really realized how important the support was that you got there and then a year later or something you, you became a doula and that was your entrance into the birth world. Right, and, and so I started as a postpartum doula, so okay. that was the ad that I answered, right? And then I had a postpartum doula agency for a while in South Florida called Tenth Month. My business is now called Birth in the Know. It's transformed as I have <laughs> over the years. Uh, but I, so I did the postpartum work for many years, and this was before I had my second one. And what I heard about the birth stories and what I was hearing was horrifying to me. Now this is, was back in the mid '90s, mm -hmm. and sadly, we're, it's you know the trend hasn't been getting better in most places, as you know, what happens with birth. So yeah. these are mostly hospital births, right. of course. And I was getting ready to have another baby, and I thought, I will never go to any of those hospitals. I mean, literally, I was afraid to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The first time I did give birth in the hospital, I had a midwife. It, it wasn't as bad as it might have been in other instances or a different hospital. I was in Boston. So now I'm in South Florida, right? And I'm hearing all these stories and I'm thinking, no way. Hell no. I did not put me back in that hospital. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, I felt like as the postpartum doula, it was talk about emotional support. Mm -hmm. Listening to these stories and then and thinking, wow, I, I, I just can't. Mm -hmm. My heart, I was, my heart was, uh, I don't know, just um, incredibly saddened and was quite an eye-opener at that time. So then, 
Yeah, just so, so then I said, well, I get to be a birth doula because now maybe I need to go start there so we don't have this cleanup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, so I did that for a couple years, you know, in, in the process of running my business and another uh, harrowing experience. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So through um, your own transformation, professional transformation as, you know, being a postpartum doula, then being a doula, and then eventually becoming an, a trainer and educator, you also had two of your own babies. And one of them, the first one, as you just said, was in the hospital. And the second one, you then decided, hello, leave me the fuck out of the hospital. <laughs> I'm going to have this baby at home. So tell me a little bit, like, what was the biggest difference for you? Um, you know, let's, let's put it in, like, different categories. Categories, like, physically, what was the biggest difference for you? And then emotionally support and also, like, you know, spiritually and mentally between having your baby in the hospital and having your baby at home. Yeah, wow. It's, so I had seven years in between. So just to say that, and I'd also, yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was married before with my first, and that didn't work out. P.S., seven years later, I'm ready, I'm educated, I've been a doula. And I think when you have a home birth, you do need to do a lot of your homework, your research. I, home birth people seem to be more educated about the process, and, and for me it was what I, what I wanted, I wanted that calmness, I wanted my family, I wanted to be comfortable in my own surroundings, and mm -hmm. so that was, there were many reasons, and was there a specific um, event or a specific thing in the hospital that really just bugged you, where you said, like, that's why I don't want to go back? Uh, I think maybe just the, well, between being a very sterile environment, Mm -hmm. And remember, I was in Boston, more progressive. I'm in the Northeast right now. It's definitely much more progressive. Still depends on the hospital. But let, for example, at that time, my water broke completely, and I went 36 hours. Now, had I been in Florida, I might have been, had a C-section. Totally. Even back in the 90s. You know, Nowadays, it, you definitely would have. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? So there was that aspect. So now I'm in South Florida. It's very different. And so it was mainly those stories that I was sharing earlier and then knowing a bit more as a doula, you know, books that I was reading. Uh, I had also in 1996 been a part of the creation of the Mother Friendly Childbirth Initiative. Mm -hmm. And so this was a year later. So I just knew so much and mm -hmm. I felt so confident mm -hmm. about giving Let's birth. Let's bookmark this one you knew more about your own body and that made you trust more in your own body. And that's why you said, okay, no more hospital. I can do this. I trust myself. I am capable. I can be at home where it's not sterile, where I have my environment and the people I love around me. I like that. Yes. And that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. And that trust in the process is huge. And how do you teach that to someone, mm -hmm. right? How do you teach someone to trust? And I think it goes hand in hand with what, what somebody knows when they're in it. So just, you know, say, so there's a pregnant woman and she comes to me and says, I, I want your support. I, I want some guidance. Where do I begin? And I begin where she's at. And I ask a lot of questions, right? So where, what is she thinking? What has she been witnessing? What stories, what birth stories has she been hearing about? Because that's all going to play a role. We oh, absolutely. Yeah. Everything we, everything we soak up from the outside influences our internal experience, right? So as much as we want to um, let, us in, let, let it influence us, right? I was just hearing the other day a quote that I really liked, and it said, um, let your inside voice be louder than the outside voice. And I, I thought that. I thought that was like an amazing, an amazing quote because it's like that's exactly it. Like do not listen to what people tell you on the outside because they just have their own experiences. You rather need to listen, listen to your inner voice and create your own experience. That's what's missing. 
-hmm. We are missing that in our in our culture in our world. We're not listening to to what's what we're being told. We ignore those things that come to us through our intuition oftentimes, right? Because we don't trust it. And then we have to go look it up. We have to Google it mm. to get our answer. No. Fucking Google. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, listen, when I grew up, you know, there was no computers or the, you know, we had to go to the library, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, in the book. <laughs> we had to look it up, right? We had to look. But the point is, um, because we're not trusting that, we think we have to find the answers everywhere out here. Mm -hmm. As you said, it, it really is an inner journey. All of life is an inner journey because we're always interpreting our experiences. And birth doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So who is that woman? And, you know, how has she gotten to this place? And it's not, it's not an isolated thing, right? Right, right. So it's, it's how does she view birth? How does she view life? How does she do, handle pain? How, you know, it's perception. You hear that pain is a perception. It really is a perception. How does your own intuition and your own knowing of your body then helped you with the, your birth at home? Well, I, I think it was, I wasn't afraid going into it. Ooh. Even the first time, I really wasn't afraid. I was more afraid of this thing when he came out, not so much the later. <laughs> about how to care for a baby. That was where my biggest fear was, actually, right. even the first time. So, you no, know, I think a lot, a lot of times we actually forget, forget that. And I actually shared this fear yesterday um i had a moment where i was like oh my god i'm 20 weeks along now there's i'm halfway through and like there will be a real freaking little baby that i gotta nurse and take care of and love and not that i think the love is gonna be the problem i'm gonna love this little thing so much but like there is a huge responsibility and i feel like often like there, that's why i'm so glad to talk to you too and like about the whole postpartum experience because what we you know, in this whole pregnancy, we often feel like birth is the only big event that there is. And then there, all of a sudden the party stops afterwards. It's like, no, actually, that's where the party starts. <laughs> and like women always like, you know, prepare themselves for that birthing experience, which is really important and has such a big effect on how you actually mother as well. But it goes on after that. That's for sure. And the fear that we have or the influences that we take from the outside, I think we take that into our mothering as well. Yes, we do. And that's why it's so important to be working on this part. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, it's, it's a combination. I think you mentioned earlier about balance. So mm -hmm. mind, body, spirit balance mm -hmm. is really, I think, the key in life mm -hmm. and no different for birth. True. And, you know, so everybody comes to it from a different place. And so for me, I think there were so many differences. First of all, I did have a loving, supportive husband the second time. My mom was still in the picture. I also had my son, who was then seven. Was he there at the birth? Uh, yes, yeah, so he was at that's the birth. amazing. Uh, he was at the birth. So wonderful. I wish I could have seen my little baby brother be born. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it was great. I, I remember him bringing me my drink and putting a cloth on my head. Oh, and that's so wonderful. That's such a like a family event. Then it was right? fun. It was fun. I had uh, I had two midwives, and I had two student midwives. Also, wow, that's a full house right there. Yeah, yeah I had a full <laughs> bedroom. <laughs> and what was really great was. I felt really good after. First, I was smiling when I was crowning. Like, wow. You know, you hear all these stories about crowning. I don't remember the first time, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I don't remember exactly, but I don't think I was smiling. But I was okay, you know. But I was so comfortable and confident and calm and just so that story here about the, you know, ring of fire and it's going to stretch, it's going to burn. Well, there's all kinds of sensations going on, but what are you focused on? What are you concentrating on? Are you, mm -hmm. are you focused on your breathing, on the love around you? Or, mm -hmm. you know, are you in the hospital with bright lights and chaos and noise mm -hmm. and you get tightened up? Mm -hmm. Big difference. Totally. Yeah. I think that's a, an important aspect that honestly, like, 
yeah, you just sparked something in me. Like, what, what is it? What is it that I focus on in that moment of, you know, whatever you want to call it, discomfort, intensity, pain, stretching, whatever it is, right? Contracting, rush, however, you know, whatever word you you're calling it. But what are you actually focusing on? Is it that intense, uncomfortable feeling, or is it the love that you receive and the support and the excitement to welcome this new baby into your life and build this relationship and the spiritual growth that's behind all that. Yeah, and, and also uh, we, we actually don't want to be doing a lot of thinking in birth, right, because it's going to get in our way in a sense, right. but, but the focus on whatever it is that the, if you're using your breathing, I mean, breathing is really the key. Not that the special, you know, hee hee hoo hoo ha ha stuff like we used to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? You used to be not that way, like hee hee hoo. But it's. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you know, if you focus on. I'm glad breathing. we're over that. I'm glad we're yeah. over that. I'm glad women are allowed to breathe however the hell they yeah. want. Honestly, so though, I've experienced in the hospital, like coached pushing, where still labor and delivery nurses and doctors like tell moms to like hold their breath and now breathe out through like a straw or whatever the heck. I, I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous, actually. It is very ridiculous because what you want to do is just, if you're, like you mentioned earlier, be in tune with what's happening with your body. And so when you're giving birth, you know, you're in tune, you're feeling the sensations, whatever you want to call it, you're feeling it all. But you're allowed to move freely. And maybe you want to dance. Maybe you want to get on all fours. Whatever you need to do is what you do. And that's it. And which, why it's, it's harder to achieve in the hospital. Mm -hmm. They're on a time clock. They want to intervene. Mm -hmm. They want to hurry up. All of that stuff does not support a birthing person at all. Yeah. None of that being supports. Being in tune and being truly connected to yourself and to the feelings and to actually like staying in the present moment. I think that's like the most important thing, right? Totally. Yeah. Staying present because that fear, whatever we have before that fear, whatever the fear is, it's always a made up thing about what if, or this might happen kind mm -hmm. of thing, which mm -hmm. it's okay. Like it's normal. Yes. It's an unknown thing. Right. But how do we look at it? How do we deal with it? And, right? Yeah. Where do we put our focus on? And can we stay in the present moment? I like this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best. <laughs> so um, going back to, to some of my questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know. So I guess. <laughs> oh no no and it, it's perfectly fine We're, there's so much you know so birth is not a straightforward li forwarded linear thing that's the thing right so that's why we're talking about all the things that come come together um that make birth and make pregnancy and make this uh, experience happen right um one thing that i'm interested in that i want to from know from you is what do you believe is most important for women to feel truly respected in you know in this experience of giving birth and and you know that so that she can get that empowering experience that she actually wants and deserves as well right um you, you mentioned a few things earlier you said you know what helped you was being at home obviously right to feel like you have the support that you need which is something that i think a lot of women often don't understand that they don't get that support in the hospital. They often feel like, well, but I have my nurses there. And of, often, um, unfortunately, and I'm not going to shit talk nurses here. I have a few wonderful, wonderful nurse friends, but um, often they're not even able to give that support that women might need because they're running around in a floor of 10 um, birthing women and they're more focused on the monitors and the beeping and the blood pressure and all of the stuff that's going on um, and so women don't often have that support in a hospital which they need to have a better experience um, and what else do you believe is is important for women to create that empowering experience for themselves I think women need to be heard and listened to. Mm -hmm. And of course, well before the birth, 
ideally, they've got a birth doula with them to to support the process. Where, you know, if they're going to a busy hospital where there's going to be nurses in and out and strangers and all of that. But really, I think what's important is for for women to do their own kind of self reflection and dig deep and and vision their birth, draw it, write it, speak about it beforehand. Yeah. Because that, that's what's going to come with them. Yeah. But also really to be truly listened to by any mm -hmm. staff or any person that is in touch with them throughout the process. Mm -hmm. No negating like, oh, no, like that's silly or don't worry about that or, oh, you don't want to do this or, or you listen to some horrible birth stories. Right. Oh, you know, like you, you know, you're pregnant now. You, you know a lot and you've learned a lot. And you get to say no if you don't want to hear something, or oh, yeah, I have you know to. what I mean. Yield my yeah, you have yeah. to. You want to protect yourself. So I think that throughout, um, that's really important. That in order to have, you know, be in control. You know, what are we actually in control of? Now I've learned this. This is well after my births, but what are we truly in control of? Our own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Right, and then how we're reacting or not reacting, right, to circumstances, people, you know, relationships, right? So, again, it goes back to that inner journey. And so, to really be in control of the process of birth, you've got to be able to say, you know, this is what I envision, or you know, this is what I want to know more about, or this is who I really am feeling connected with or want to connect with. You know, who do I want to support me in the whole process? And who will really listen when I say, you know, whether I say, no, I don't want that epidural, or maybe it's, yes, I do. Right. But it, it, it's being discussed and dealt with prior to so that when the moment comes, there's an understanding with whoever, you know, is with the birthing woman. You just mentioned um, being in control, and that, that's like an interesting concept because um, in the last 20 weeks, I've actually been working through that a lot of like, am I actually in control of this experience or am I actually only in control of how I'm handling this experience and what I'm focusing on and if I stay present with the experience? Because at the end, I believe birth is something that we're not really controlling, right? It's like something... The, these little cells in my belly, they've been dividing if I control this or not, right? The little hands and feet have been forming and the ears and the eyes without my control, right? And I believe like birth is going to be the exact same thing. It's not really in my control, but there is an underlying like sequence and knowledge there, that natural sequence that if we just let it be, then it will do itself, right? And we just have to kind of get out of the way. And the only <laughs> thing we can truly control is like, as you said, our own thoughts. Like, how do I think about it? How do I perceive this intense feeling? How do I, what do I focus on, right? Am I focusing on staying in the present moment or am I focusing on my fear and, and who's coming in the room or what's going on on the outside instead of, being focused on the inside so that's um that's an interesting aspect yes yeah and that's it because it can be an out-of-control experience and you can feel powerless or you can feel that you're in charge and you come out it, it's powerful i mean no no matter what birth will transform you it'll trans it transforms you it just does right But, and it can be the most amazing transformational event of your life. And you can feel so powerful. And then you're moving into motherhood with that feeling of being powerful. Do you have an, an example for that? I mean, besides your own example of feeling really empowered, do you, do you know of any mama that you can tell us that felt really empowered in, in this birthing experience because she was ex uh, respected and because she was you know, in, in charge, basically, of her own experience. Yeah, you know, it's hard to uh, remember, like, specific births. Um, I haven't been an active birth dealer for a while, so. But also, like, but, you, know, you work with women postpartum, so you yeah, see the repercussions of, you know, the, the birthing yeah. experience. 
but I have seen the variation. And so when I listen to a birth story and then I'm witnessing what's happening in the early weeks, uh, you know, it totally relates. I, this is what I've been teaching about now, the forgotten mm -hmm. fourth trimester and connecting not only what came before, but then that actual birth experience, you know, had, did she have, um, an, you know, an emergency or unexpected cesarean? One in three women are having cesarean, so that's going to play a role. Did she feel out of control? Was the baby taken away? Was there, so all of those things. How does that influence a mother? Like, say she has a, an emergency C-section or, you know, a C-section that wasn't planned in any way. Like, how, how do you see that later on play out in her role as a mother? Well, first off, she could be grieving. Mm. She could be grieving, and, you know, or she, or she could be experiencing post-traumatic stress, depending on, on how traumatic the birth was mm -hmm. and how her experience of it was, really. Again, mm -hmm. back to her experience. Because you could talk to... Two people with this with a similar experience, and one could be, you know, rising above and and processing. However, you know, maybe whatever. Call it two weeks later, and you could have another person who is still quite involved with, like, how did that happen, and why, and maybe like, what did I do wrong? It could be some feeling like it was her fault. Mm. So because you have so many different people, right, and with different ways of being and experiencing things, it can be very different. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, it's important for that, that mom to process, to talk about it, to, to let it out, and to just to, to begin to get engaged in, in the positive aspect now of being a mother and, you know, being a parent. And it is going to vary from person to person. But it totally affects the early experience, confidence, because mm -hmm. think about that. If, if there was the unexpected, right, mm -hmm. um, and you feel like you weren't in control and, mm -hmm. like, what Someone did I do wrong? overpowered you in a sense, yeah. Yeah. You don't have the confidence, and then you're going into the parenting experience with that lack of confidence. Totally. And that plays out in those early weeks and months. <laughs> and how about breastfeeding? Do you, well, see, you see how this influences as well. I've I've experienced it um, in my own practice that I've seen uh, moms that you know had traumatic experiences or even like abusive experiences uh, in the hospital that had um, immense trouble breastfeeding and bonding with their baby as well. They're actually like, you know, some of them resented their baby. Um, because they couldn't quite put these two experiences together of, you know, receiving this beautiful miracle gift of having a new baby in their life. And at the same time, like having experienced something dramatic or so painful or so overpowering where they felt so helpless that they kind of disconnect from the entire experience. And so they also disconnect from the love and the bonding to their baby. Yes. Yes, I actually heard a story the other day in my class that somebody shared, someone she had been working with, and it was that kind of a thing where because the association of that traumatic birth had to do with the baby, there, there was a lack of bonding. Mm -hmm. And we do want to be encouraging as much as possible a connection there because we know that that plays out in a, over a lifetime. When a, when a baby for both right for the yes, baby for and the mother yeah, yeah yes and we don't have a secure attachment now it doesn't mean if a baby has to be separated for medical reason and you know and then connects it doesn't mean it's impossible but if you've got that disassociation that's something it actually may require more than a doula to help you know to bridge that totally um, but it's it's the key to our healthy nation. <laughs> when mother baby's healthy. <laughs> right. I mean, it is, it is trauma after all. And as, as, as far as I know from, you know, the little bit of trauma training that I, I had in the past, it's like trauma makes us dissociate, right? Uh, physically dissociate. That's why, you know, breastfeeding, that is a very physical thing, uh, can be very um, challenging for moms. And also, like, makes us dissociate in our, you know, emotions and our spiritual connection. 
because we just don't want to experience that pain again right so and i think that's like that's the biggest thing that um, for a lot of women that can be traumatic um when they've been um disconnected from their baby if you see like i don't know i'm I'm a little weird but i've been watching like birth videos of animals lately i don't know be a squirrel being born and like (laughs) a type tiger cats being born and uh, I, I don't know what's going on but but like if you see that you know like the, this the mother baby bond right there like the mother licks the baby and she like you know she keeps it real close and 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 you know she just like she would go crazy you would she would attack you if you would try to take her baby away so if we think about what that does to us and we are mammals after all, right? If you break it down to the core of it all, we are mammals. So if you take away the baby from the mother, that is like a real deep experienced pain. I remember actually my mom, I was born as a C-section and my mom, and it actually like makes me really sad to talk about that. But she said when I was born, um, you know, it was in 81. So she was like put out completely. So she woke up like a few hours afterwards and there was no baby in her belly and there was no baby in the room. And she said she just had this, Mm. the deepest feeling of loss and grief and, you know, uncertainty of like, oh my God, like, where is my baby? It's not there. It's not in me anymore, but it's also not on me or you know on top of me or suckling on me or whatever so that experience just that besides you know the physical drama of being cut open and all of that um can leave a mom really traumatized i know it's truly sad it really saddens me we've we've medicalized birth we've created all this fear around it so then what do we want to do we want to interfere right we want to use all these interventions, and as Michelle Adant would say, just, you know, hang out in the corner and just allow that woman to do what she's got to do. But what, 98%, at least in the U.S., which is where I am, right, um, give birth in the hospital. I think and, 98% right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's most women. And, of course, you know, years ago it was the opposite. Hardly anybody did. Now, does a hospital save lives? Yes. Can it? Sure. But do we need to do this one size fits all? You know, I mean, you're talking about things are very, breath is very normal, right? It's, it's a physiological process. We are mammals. You're witnessing normal birth when you're watching those animals because there's nobody there to, to, you know, exactly. they, they, don't, need they, don't, need, they <laughs> don't need anyone to tell them yeah. what to do. They know. And, Exactly. So I think what women have lost that confidence of that they know what to do. And so, which you mentioned earlier about younger girls and young women really learning their bodies, knowing their bodies, trusting what their bodies can do, and then, and then learning all about the birth options. Then when they get to that point, you know, we've normalized it somewhat. We, we just, we're so far from that right now. It's just crazy how far we've come. Oh yeah, we normalized the medical, um, yeah. the, the medical birth, and we normalized right. the trauma that's happening. Happening that is, in my eyes, even more dangerous. That we're normalizing something that shouldn't be normal at all. Just because it is common, we mix it up somehow, right? Because we have every third baby be born as a C-section or even more, right? If you, if you listen around in your circle of friends, like almost everyone has at least a one C-section birth story that they've heard from someone. So it's like, it's, and you know, this is what we teach then to our new generation of kids, right? It's like, if I only had C-sections, well, that's what my kids think is normal, right? So we're perpetuating this, you know, normalizing of of trauma and interventions, and we're going further and further away from what is actually, you know, natural and normal. Yeah, and it's really, I mean, it's, it runs deep in our culture, there are young women that that's all they see and that's what they think is normal. And so how do we address that? And of course, one family at a time, you know, one mother, one baby, one doula at a time. So I love teaching of the doula stuff that I know. 
because I feel like that kind of rallies up the troops and you know I'm not on the I'm not in the direct line right now so I I teach which is what I love but I know I respect so much doulas that are out there but I, I also wonder sometimes and this is probably controversial you know we have doulas doulas have been around they're growing not everyone has one hardly anybody that needs one has a doula I mean right even though it's grown and the you know when I started there was no certification so <laughs> now there's umpteen organizations but 14,000 yeah yeah I mean there's a lot but then again it's like okay so what you know what difference are doulas making I mean they are making a difference but I feel like it's that prenatal prenatal education yes and planting those seeds right yes even with what comes after birth when you have this thing most childbirth education classes they they don't really cover anything they might mention a tidbit Oh, and then you have the baby and, you know, bonding, breastfeeding, the end, right? Two minutes. But Diapering. now, what's that? Diapering, burping, here we go. Yeah, I mean, that, you figure that stuff out. But what about like this? Like what, you know, how do I interact and bring my baby into my family? And not how, do I not, how do I not go crazy when the baby has like a two-hour release cry every night because it just needs to process yeah. some emotions or whatever, right? Yeah, right. I, yeah I, I completely agree with you. There is this big um, disconnect again here, right? We have, we have women outsource their responsibility to either the medical system, a doctor, a midwife, or then a doula. And I experienced this myself with some of my clients. I believe they were, and you know, that's my own fault as well, or I don't like to address just fault but rather responsibility it's my own responsibility I was very um, connected to the outcome of my client's birth right so um, I kind of took responsibility for their birth experience and so they didn't take that responsibility and that's what's happening right so a, a doula can't really save you from anything <laughs> if you're in a hospital if you're at home and you haven't done all that work that you've been talking about that inner work that being in tune with yourself that feeling your own energy and that connection to yourself and your baby and you know besides like being super healthy and eating healthy and moving throughout pregnancy and all these physical things. But if you haven't done that work on yourself, releasing your fears and truly trusting in your own capable body, no doula will make a difference at the end. And I feel like I sometimes spend hours and hours be like a ninja doula <laughs> in hospitals, I feel, where there's like, I was just like, wow, wow, no interventions, and let give her time, and, you know, and like, let her be alone with her husband, and, you know, just really like trying to push everyone away to just give her the time to make her own decisions, but I don't believe that's the true deepest core of what a doula should be. A doula should just be to literally hold the energy in the space, support the mother if she needs to have an uplifting word or if she needs some water, if she needs like her, you know, a cold cloth or something like that, right? But she shouldn't be there to actually like make decisions for her or take responsibility for her. And that's where we need to start. We need to start very early on, even before pregnancy if we can, but if we're already in pregnancy, I feel like we need to start like you know, as soon as possible, educating women on what they need to know about themselves and giving them tools like yoga and Reiki to tune in and connect and connect with their intuition and their instinct and their mammal innate knowing of, I know that I can do this. I am literally made to do this, right? Yes, that was beautiful. I mean, at Absolutely. It, it, we have, uh, you know, this training and this education, this childhood education, this doula training, like all this stuff, which I like to say, it's not really rocket science. I mean, I was a trainer and I did a three-day postpartum doula training course and a lot of information, great stuff, but there's always more to know. Nice. So really uh, that, like when you're talking about the woman who is pregnant, that's the work. This is the work that it has to be done and that's why I say you know can I actually uh, 
you know, accomplish that for her? No. I can encourage, I can guide, I can mention tools that I'm aware of or that I've used or that other clients have used, right? Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's about it's about her or, or the couple or whatever. And I think asking questions rather than, you know, being a doula or a child with educator, you say, oh yeah, like I know and you know, I'll help you find it and I got the answer, but but maybe it's more about, okay. What do you know? What do you want to know? What are you feeling? And and then being that guide, but like just being the guide, and like you said, holding the space and and being clear that you know my job is this, and you, you guys, you who's ever your partner, you have to figure this out. But I'll tell you, just say you do know about the particular hospital. I'm just gonna say hospital because 98 percent of people, right, are giving birth there, but. Particularly, my goal was to get women though out of the hospital. I know. So and I'm just gonna, home. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So I'm saying, like, okay. So if you're home or birth center, you're less likely to need to or to have to be doing the interference, running interference, right? Yeah. Defending yourself. Yeah. yeah. As a doula, as a partner, whatever, or as your own, <laughs> you know, self. Home, birth center much less likely, if at all, having to do that kind of stuff. When you enter the hospital, you're entering the medical system. Birth is not an illness, but it will be treated as such in most instances. Unless, what I've been hearing from people is they, a lot of doulas, they, they, they go in with their clients when they're just about ready to push the baby out. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, I'm thinking they might as well stay at home. But that's what, what I'm saying. I don't understand why would I get in the car yeah. and drive for half an hour just to have someone like put a gown on me and stick their fingers in my vagina? And I know. Say, okay, <laughs> now you're ready. Now push and oh, hey, lay, you know, lay back on your back. And, and yeah, like, yeah. But it, it is, you know, the thing is, if we don't know, then we are uncertain. And if we're uncertain, and there is an experience happening to us that we've never experienced before, then we can get really freaking scared, right? If we're at home and we don't have a doula there that tells us, hey, you're doing great, everything is normal. Yes, shit's getting really way more intense now. If nobody is there and we don't have that wise woman and we don't have all that knowledge that maybe you and I have because we're in this world forever, um, you know, then things can get really scary. And if you then maybe have a partner that doesn't know either and doesn't really trust the process, then that can get really scary. And then women like end up after a few hours going to the hospital and then, you know, the cascade of interventions takes, takes its place, right? And then yeah. often they end up in a C-section. So knowing what's happening is a really good way to prevent that. And having someone there that is experienced and someone that, you know, can hold space for you and can just tell you you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Don't be afraid. You're exactly mm. where you're supposed to be. I think that's the only literal, the only thing a doula really should do, right, is to, to reassure a woman in her own intuition and in her own knowing. I really like the name of your, of your business called Birth in the Know, right? That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Yeah, if you know yeah. about it. You have a whole different experience right that's why yeah I like to say knowledge is power I do believe knowledge is power and then you get to go the next step okay I know all this stuff I know my options I've learned and I get to trust totally. and I get to be with people that will support my process right and, you know and, and where I am but you do got to know some stuff because, you, you, you know, going in blind and not knowing even terminology or things that are getting thrown around, you, you, then, yeah, of course, like, oh, my God, what's happening? So I guess I don't understand. I guess I don't, I just don't get it. I don't get how, um, you know, people get to that point where they, they just kind of go in blindly. And, and I think it has to do with healthcare in general, too, I think, especially for women. Well, it's like, you know, we are kind of used to give away responsibility, right? Yeah. We're used to go to the doctor and have them fix us, right? We're right. used to go to our employee and let them tell what we're supposed to do for today, right? So there is this cultural 
understanding of we're not in charge of our own lives. And I just had an amazing uh, interview with uh, Hermine Hayes Klein. She's a lawyer and advocate. I'm, I'm sure you know her too. Um, for maternity, uh, maternity care and reproductive health. And she said that very explicitly. She's like, well, women just don't know that they're in charge of their own body. They don't know that they can say no to things. And, and nurses, LD nurses especially, often don't know that they can't just put something on a woman and that the body is hers to decide. And even though they believe the baby might be compromised in any way, that does not give them the right at all to, you know, uh, decide over a patient's body or opinion, right? You're a, still your own authority. And I think that's something that women really need to know. And when we understand that on the deepest level, then we can take responsibility for our own care. And when we do that, then we're not just trusting anyone else. But if we don't know better if we don't know what's going on and as you said and we're not educated about you know our physiology and our anatomy and you know the intense spiritual and emotional um, uh, things that can, that can go on going through labor then we're much easier to trust someone else on the outside that appears to be an authority and tells us, well, that's the best thing to do. And then there is, you know, bullying methods and manipulation methods and saying, well, I, do you not want to have a healthy baby? Or are you, you know, compromising your baby and not having a C-section? And imagine a woman being in labor for 20 hours, right? Going through this intense experience and then someone else that we perceive as an authority comes in to tell us something like that. And if we don't know better, if we don't know what's actually truly normal and what we're capable of and we don't have this trust in ourselves established through the last nine months or, you know, hopefully through an entire life, then we're much easier to just give up that responsibility and let others decide. Yeah, so, that, so it goes back to the whole thing of you know, you've got this pregnant woman, right, um, whatever age she is, but... Uh, it, it starts so much before, I mean, well before that, right? What are young girls learning about their bodies? And it has it been, I was thinking about this, I mentioned this to somebody, oh, my friend's daughter who's here, she's a real women's right advocate and she's going off to college and I was, you know, I'm like filling her up, right? Because that's me. Um, what, you know, what are they learning and then how are they getting to that point of, you know, I don't own this body, like, do what you want, like, I'm scared to death, just, I mean, and again, I'm not blaming, it's just, it's this exactly. whole cultural thing yeah. that, that we have given that up, and of course, I believe that, you know, men know how powerful we are as women, right, and they birth better. is something they can, <laughs> right, I mean, they better, right, but no, but seriously, right, I mean, we, we all have feminine and masculine energy, but women are powerful, women can give birth, women are powerful, and so I think throughout history, we, you know, as you can see, we've been kept, you know, kind of down and, you know, we got to keep these women in their place. Overpowered. Yes, absolutely. Heaven forbid. I mean, you know, I've been called a witch, you know, because <laughs> whatever, I you know, have some, in, some intuitive, you know, stuff. Yes, that, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> I know. I don't give a, I don't give an F up. Okay. I don't give a fuck. I use a fuck. But, but. I'm just saying, again, culturally, right? We're, like, I'm looked at as weird because I was afraid to get an epidural. Like, I would never have a needle in my back. And then, of course, how many, like, what percentage of women get? A huge percentage of women, right? In, right. at least in the U.S., right? Yeah. So when you're, like, opposite and you're, so, you're, even though, like, you and I, we know that uh, what we're talking about here and, and our views, we know how much that will support better outcomes with women being basically left alone, being knowledgeable, standing in their power, and being left alone to do what they want, right? Right. But when you go against the grain of culture, right? Oh, you know what? Like, you know what's wrong with her? Or you know she's the wacko? Or, I don't care. I mean, I don't give a crap what what people think. But but I'm just saying. Even so, you look at the the birthing woman, and she's got her family, and she's got this, and she's got the media, and heavy influence. And so if she oh. can't you know, disregard all that and say, hell no. Yeah. And it starts... Judgment is so powerful. I think you had a, 
Um, last time when we talked, actually, I think um, we connected because you had a little Facebook Live all about judgment, right? And as much as you say, like, you know, you and I both were getting judged and everyone that goes against the grain, the 1% of women then that decide in America to birth at home will be judged. But um, we're not judging here anyone that, you know, went to the hospital, got an epidural, had a C-section. This is not what it is, this is for. This is not to judge anyone that made a decision that we're not agreeing with or not support or whatever. This is to really give women a different perspective of, what is actually happening and out there happening out there and what what you should know to be able to make your own informed choice of what you truly want because what is it lacking it often is the knowledge because doctors are not open about their c section rates they're mm. not you know displaying it transparently to you and say well every six or every third baby that i'm helping to deliver, I actually deliver with a scalpel, right? If a woman mm. would know that from the beginning, she would maybe have a different um, decision about if she chooses this person as their care provider, right? But there's a lot of things that are being manipulated and that are being held from women actually making their whole choice. So, And women deal with the judgment as well because C-section interventions, hospital births are so common that if you do something else, if you go against the crane, people judge you, your family judges you, your parents say, oh, but this is not safe, and you're going to die at home, and have you seen the statistics, and, you know, all of these things, that is exactly why I'm doing this interview series with all kinds of people from, you know, different views of, of birth, and, and, you know, I just had uh, Stuart Fishbein on as well, who's a home birth obstetrician, um, who completely, you know, he, he was at 25 years, what's beeping here, <laughs> 25 years in the hospital, and he um, decided that this is not the environment he wants to be in anymore, and he wants to support women at home with home births, right? You ask yourself, well, if a doctor is saying that, right, they're just like, <laughs> something, must be, something must be on this topic to look at a little deeper. So, um, you know, away from the judgment, we don't want to judge anyone, and women need to be able to stand, stand above that judgment that they get from others if they make decisions that are not common to what their friends or family have been telling them before. Yeah, you know, something you just said, so like Dr. Fishbein, right? Okay, so there's a doctor, so you have doctors, you have midwives, and I like to say, um, you know, it's not necessarily their degree, but which model of care, right? Because, you know, there's two models of care, the midwifery model and the medical model. So Dr. Fishbein practices the midwifery model of care, right? Right. Even though he's an obstetrician trained, which is right. Yes. He's trained, right. So he's a trained surgeon. Because, yes. by the way, obstetricians are trained surgeons. They want to do, I mean, that's what they know how to do. Right. I'm not saying they all want to do it, but I don't know. It's, you know, it's crazy how many... Um, cesarean sections are performed, right? But it is that that view of birth. So the first thing I think that women should do is, is look at those two models of birth and then choose a doctor or a midwife or a family physician or, you know. Or, or be all by themselves or, that what they want, yeah. right? I support right. that as well. Yep. Or full be, autonomy, right. full sovereignty for women. Yes. Whatever you choose, but, but no, choose from a place of knowledge. Yes. There's this option, there's this option. Now, sadly, not everybody does have all the options because insurance dictates or money dictates, which is another whole story. Right. But at least no. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I believe um, that you can stem you know, the rest of your decisions from which model of care is going to serve you better. I like that. At least no. <laughs> okay, Betsy, we're coming to an end. I have a last <laughs> powerful question for you. Okay. So I want you to be around for a long time because the things you teach are very important. Um, connecting to your intuition, connecting to your own inner trust and your own knowing, birthing in the know is very important. But imagine you would leave this planet 
<laughs> off on a whatever spaceship <laughs> tomorrow and you only have one very important passionate message to share with the world what would it be i would say life is now and gratitude so meaning you know seize the day be present and be grateful for all that you have and all that you are and you know don't wait to do that thing that you think you're going to do 10 years from now mm -hmm. you know really take take charge of your life and if you haven't given birth yet you take charge of your life in this way when you get to that process of giving birth you'll you'll already be in that driver's seat because you'll have really mm -hmm. you know taken each moment and and uh been present no regrets yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Being in the driver's seat, that is a good, um, that's a good image, yes, for birth as well. Be in the driver's seat. Don't get in the back seat. Don't get in the freaking <laughs> front. Let the passenger get lit. Be in the driver's seat of the whole thing. <laughs> Betsy, how can we connect with you? How can people learn from you? I know you definitely have this amazing, wonderful game, and I found it on your website as well. So share your website with us. Share if you have any um, workshops coming up or trainings coming up or where people can find you. Okay, so birth in the know, as you mentioned, and I have to tell you my tagline. Where questions are conceived and answers are born. Ooh, ooh, nice. <laughs> Thank you to my dad, the admin. Um, so anyway, but that's my website. And yes, I have my game, Down the Canal, the Game of Birth. You can get it through that my That is for site. doulas as well as an educational a tool or as well for any birthing mother, prenatal yoga teacher, educator, any, anyone that works with pregnant mamas. Yes, and not pregnant. Teenagers, just, you know, learning about the process. Yeah, why right? didn't I think about that? Totally. No, it started way early. Yes. Why not? I have it for 16 and up, but it's 240 questions to test your birth knowledge, where you're at. You learn a lot and you have fun in the process. I love it. So that's my game. I have an online classroom on Teachable, which you can get from my website as well. Okay. Um, so the, I have, that's all for doulas and other birth workers. Some of them for CEUs, some of them just like one of them, uh, the inner journey, the inside journey to success for doulas. Are you so offering that, as well postpartum care for mamas? Um, I do have a four trimester journey, uh, journey course okay. online, which is designed for birth workers, though I am going to look at it and go through it and give it a little different twist, I think, for mamas too. Um, and dads, you know, people that, um, and grandmothers, whoever. But as it's set up for birth workers, I have that. And I do have a live course, and I'm developing more, but that one's called The Forgotten Fourth Trimester. Mm -hmm. I just did it up in New York, and I will be planning more dates. Mm -hmm. I don't have any yet, but I will be. Because it is all a continuum. It doesn't stop yes. at birth. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm up to. And I'll be speaking more about Reiki. What's going on? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's awesome, too. Nice. And I just, uh, you just mentioned that at the beginning, you just had an interview with um, Better Birth, right? Yes. So we're yeah. going to hear and see that from you as well out there. Yes, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's coming up May 29th, live, going live. Awesome. Well, you're active there. Please stay active. Please keep on working. I know you're doing this for a very long time, and I will not stop. I will not tell you to stop. I'll tell you to keep on working and spreading the word and, and helping more doulas understand better what's going on in the birth world and therefore, you know, educating and, and building that ripple effect into families and towards moms. So thank you so much for taking your time tonight and coming on with me and um, we will hear more from you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Betsy. All right. See ya. Thank you, ladies, for joining us to this great interview. If you enjoyed this, please follow the Liberated Birth Movement on Facebook or subscribe to our channel. If you have more questions how to apply these ideas to your pregnancy and birth, schedule a call and we'll get you clear on what you want and how to get it. meetme.so forward slash liberated birth. meetme.so forward slash liberated birth. Always remember, birth belongs to women.